Lord, and, and Lord, all those four things we've sung for the last month, Lord, in 2 Timothy 3.16. Father, we thank you. May your word accomplish what you will and your purpose in us today, Lord. Amen. Amen. Am I on? Yeah. Thank you. I had to try and remember where I was. Right, we're carrying on with Acts. We are getting near the end. Um, but I do want to carry on and finish it. Ron, just say it's a new year and, and that's sort of it. Um, it was a bit odd remembering where we got to. But if you just recap, we're at the end of, or just before the end of Acts chapter 21. Remember, everything that's happened, and particularly on Paul's third missionary journey, is Paul absolutely knows the Lord has spoke to him, words have been given to him that he's coming now to Jerusalem to be bound in chains and to be arrested and to be imprisoned. And many of his compatriots try to change his mind, say don't go there because this is going to happen. But Paul is absolutely set his face, like Jesus did. Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And in a sense here, Paul also set his face to go to Jerusalem. No matter what it means and what's going to happen. And we got to the point they'd just been arrested. Paul had, and again, there were loads of people who were stirring up trouble and all the crowd, and there's a whole massive uproar going on such that they have to send the soldiers out from the garrison to come and try and sort things out. And we get to, I think we got to the end of 35, 36, that it could, because of the um, tomb, verse 34, because of the tumult of the crowd, the commander of the soldiers commanded that Paul be taken into the barracks when we reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out, away with him. <laughs> Said quite a few times again, the similarities to Jesus. Setting his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that his cross, the cross was coming up. The crying and invoking of the crowd to Christ save Barabbas and away with Jesus. The crowd crying out after him, away with him. Verse 37 in Acts 21, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? And he replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul says, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he'd given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, and Paul's about here, we'll read through now, Paul's about to give there's three times of another one after this later in Acts as well. Three times Paul completely gives his testimony as to how he's arrived at this point. Any chance Paul had, <laughs> we've seen on the missionary journeys, and even now I've been arrested, the, the crowd's in a complete you know, mayhem, um, baying for my blood. Yet any opportunity that I've got to stand up and tell my testimony and preach the gospel, Paul would take. Paul as well reminded of somewhere else, and um, I remembered it, but I've not had time to look at it. There's another place Paul tells us, do not be afraid when you stand before kings and rulers. God will give you the words to speak. And Paul certainly is a person who, who um, knew that for himself, hence he could write it. You also find here, I mean, <laughs> if you're trying to read this in chapters and end at a chapter like I normally do, You'd finish Acts 21 there, halfway through a sentence. There's a great silence. He spoke to him in the Hebrew language saying, end of sentence, chapter 22. You don't finish 
you'd be shot in school. If you were a child in infant school, you wrote like that and started a sentence halfway through, a, <laughs> through what you were saying, you'd be shot. Whoever put the, uh, put the split of the chapters in, it's about the Hebrew language saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defence before you now. When they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are all today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders from whom I received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be punished. And it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, that suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you were persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. And then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, you know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and God in the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Paul here giving his testimony. We know this because we've read this story earlier. In fact, we read it when it happened. Later on, Paul, when he went to the church at Jerusalem, had to recount what had happened on the Damascus Road. We read it again. Now we read it again. It's interesting, often when you do this, there's little bits in there that aren't in the original, or there's a bit, few more words in that explaining, which is always very useful. But Paul starts off by stating, they all thought, by now, because of all the rumours that were spread, because everybody who hated Paul just said anything about him, He's cause, we've read lots of times, he's causing all the trouble, he's turning the world upside down, he's totally not following our customs and rules and laws anymore and throwing them all out, none of which was true. Paul starts off by declaring his case. Remember, I'm indeed a Jew, just like you. I'm of the Jewish faith. I was born in Tarsus, Cilicia, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel, we've read before, was one of the greatest teachers there was of the Jewish faith at the time. Not everybody, by a long stretch, would have got to sit at the feet of Gamaliel and be taught. Paul, in a sense, already had quite an upbringing um, and a lot of good, positive things going on in his life. 
taught according to the strictness of our Father's law and was zealous towards God, just as you all are today, the crowd that he's talking to. And I persecuted this way. Remember, the way is one of the names they called the Christian faith. Paul started off persecuting people who were followers of Jesus to death, binding, delivering them into prison. The high priest will bear me witness because he gave me letters. He, he and his you know, team gave me letters from the council and the elders to go and arrest these people. Indeed, even when I was on the way to Damascus, I was on my way to bring back in chains to Jerusalem those who were following this new faith. But as we know, it happened as he came near that Jesus appeared to him. What, again, <laughs> what mercy, what grace, what beauty that God, for each of us, this is us. For every single one of us, this is his, our Damascus Road experience, our conversion, our meeting with Christ, our not being interested at all, our rebelling against him, our wanting nothing to do with knowing him, knowing about him or anything. And there's a point, there's a time when God suddenly decides, Amen. I'm going to step in to your life. I'm going to enter your space into your life and speak to you and make myself known to you. He explains what God said to him and he became, as we read before, blind. He couldn't see because of the glory of the light. Had to be led by hand into Damascus. And then came across a certain Ananias. And again, Paul again is in a sense backing up everything. A devout man according to the law, having a good testing with all the Jews. So again, I'm not telling you a load of rubbish, Paul. You know, you probably, oh, a lot of you know this man. This man's a well-known man, Ananias. Good testimony among all the Jews who dwelt there. And it's him that I went to. And he told me that God says this, the God of our fathers chosen you to know his will, to see him and to hear the voice of his mouth. And you'll be my witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And then he's baptised, returns to Jerusalem and has a, a vision warning him to make haste to get out of Jerusalem quickly because they won't receive his testimony there. Remember, this is he's talking back at his conversion. They won't receive your testimony. And even Paul says, you know, in a sense, I'm not surprised. A few days ago, literally, a few days ago, they all know I'm the one, Paul, who was imprisoning them in every synagogue you're imprisoned to beat those who believed in you. And reminds us, it sort of says, but almost doesn't wholly say before in Acts at Stephen's um, stoning. But here he says, I was there when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed. I was standing by consenting to his death and God in the clothes of those who were killing him. Different words as well. He wouldn't have said anything about Stephen before. He said, the, you know, this follower of the way, this, this deluded man, this whatever. Now he refers to him, your martyr Stephen. He's now a brother with Stephen. He's now a fellow believer. He now understood what it was that Stephen did when he stood there and was stoned and martyred. And maybe even knowing as well now, Paul, in his own mind, that's where he's going. This is the direction he's now taking. Then he said to me in the vision, Depart, I'll send you far from here to the Gentiles. But what does that do? And they listened to him until this word, until these last words he's just said. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. He's not fit to live. And as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Paul was doing all right, actually. He was probably doing well with that sermon until the point that he mentioned the Gentiles. When you're surrounded by devout Jews who absolutely are 
God's cream of the earth and the Gentiles are the opposite to them. And the fact that he would go and take this message to the Gentiles, suddenly then that's it, that's done it. They're in uproar. Away with him, he's not even fit to live. He's so, he's so crackpot now in his head, this Paul, the things he's saying are just so wacky and out there. Away with him. The commander orders him to be brought into the barracks that he should be examined under scourging. He might know why they so shouted against them. So as you might notes, the commander thought that the, the way they've got so stirred up the crowd, the fact they're so angry about this, Paul must have done something really bad. Not, not some silly thing he said, something they don't agree with, difference of view. Paul must have done a more serious crime to have the whole town against him in this way. And one of the ways that they would have found out... Um, you know, um, punish people to find out more information was to scourge them, to whip them and beat them. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman or a Roman citizen. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? Paul replied, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained my citizenship. Paul said, I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out he was a Roman citizen and because he'd bound him. Remember we said before, Paul has used this once, be, once or twice before, declaring that he's a Roman citizen. The truth, he's not, not saying something to try and get out of it. That's absolutely the truth. And in Roman citizens wasn't something you easily got, wasn't something just given to anybody. But once you'd got it, it was almost like a certificate of something you could show that protected you. Roman citizens had certain rights. You couldn't just arrest them and treat them like the common man, beat them up and do what you wanted to them. They had rights as if they came from the city of Rome. And Paul praised God. <laughs> God in his infinite wisdom again who works in our lives way, way, way before we start doing anything. God way back in Paul's life has arranged ordained, worked it out that Paul would have Roman citizenship. The commander was surprised. With a large sum I obtained it, I had to pay. The Roman commander had to pay to obtain this special citizenship. Paul said I was born with Roman citizenship. Possibly because of where he was born, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But God had already worked out that Paul would have this. And this has saved Paul so far two or three times from sort of immediate death. And they realised the commander, the guard, the commander, are immediately afraid because of the Rome section and they should not be binding him and punishing him in the way that they are. Verse 30. We'll carry on into 23. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why Paul was accused by the Jews... He released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. They still had, rightly or wrongly and fairly or not, but they had ordained justice. All these things, even Jesus, even though it wasn't fair, Jesus' trial, even though Jesus could have called down a thousand angels to come and rescue him and set him free. They did have justice. You came before a council of people, they listened to you, you put your side, the opposing side put their point of view, and somebody ruled on what the outcome would be. Much as we see today, so much of these things that are right have stood, as, as praying earlier on, in a sense, even today, we still have a court of law. We still have those, you know, those who are for, those who are against, and somebody who decides on the outcome of the matter, 
hundreds and hundreds of years later. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, there's another chance here for Paul to, to say what he wants, to put his side of the argument. Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The high priest Ananias, not, not the same Ananias as we talked about a few minutes ago, but the high priest Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it's written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged. When he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was decided. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confessed both. Then there was a loud outcry. The scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring them into the barracks. Interesting one here, really. Because <laughs> Paul knows that he's not going to get a fair trial here. The Jews, the high priests and everything, just like Jesus, hate him. Hate everything he's doing, standing for, saying. There's no way that he's going to put his point of view, they put theirs, and it's going to come out well for Paul. Paul looks earnestly and said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Which in a sense he had. Yes, he'd murdered Christians and that, but he knew before God, God had forgiven that. You know, in a sense, God had completely turned that round. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul sort of again, just, again recalls Jesus' words really. God will strike you whitewashed wool. What did Jesus call the Pharisees? That whitewashed sepulchres, I think. Your, empty, your tombs. You're just dead. You're whitewashed on the outside. You've been prettied up and painted so that you look nice, but on the inside, it's just, you know, what should be in a tomb is a dead, putrefied body that's rotted and everything. Inside you're rotten, just the outside looks so good. Those who stood by and said, you dare to revile God's high priest. I don't know here whether Paul's, <laughs> in my notes sort of aren't really sure, whether Paul genuinely, I didn't know he was the high priest. Because it says in the words, you shouldn't speak evil of a ruler of your people, which it does say, and the high priest is a God-set ruler of the people. I don't know whether Paul genuinely didn't know, but I can't believe that, whether Paul here is actually being rather naughty <laughs> and actually sort of making a comment that he shouldn't really be making. But then Paul perceived a bit of wisdom that, I'm not going to get it where he is, so what I'm going to actually, Paul actually here stirs up. So for once, instead of the crowd being stirred up by everybody else, Paul stirs them up. And Paul perceives, and I think again, this is mentioned a lot in Jesus' time, the sort of Jewish council and all the rulers and everything was split down two different sects. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees we hear a lot about more, and they're absolutely for the law to the very nth degree, but they do believe in a hope and resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees, and I'm always told, I remember, if you ever teach in the children, so I can't remember the Pharisee bit, but... If you want to remember which ones are sad and why, they're sad, you see, 
They don't believe in the resurrection, so they're sad, you see. They're sad, you see. Sorry. If you can't remember, that's how you do it. Um, they say there's no resurrection, no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So Paul appeals to split them up. I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. I've been a Pharisee all my life. All of this, what's being talked about, is all to do with whether we believe in the resurrection of the dead or not on being judged. Not on being judged because of believing in Jesus. So he splits up the Pharisees and the Sadducees and then they end up in a big massive argument in this court of law. And the Pharisees then are on Paul's side. So well, he's not saying anything wrong. There's no evil in this man. There's nothing to, to blame him for. And the Sadducees are, are shouting the other way. And there arose such a great dissension that the commander, fearing lest Paul be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him from among them to the barracks. The f verse 11, The following night the Lord stood by him, Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for if you have testified to me in Jerusalem, so you must almost so bear witness at Rome. Remember, Paul's heart and desires expressed it before now, but he never knew if it would happen. And in fact, he thinks possibly he's gone to Jerusalem to die, and that's it. But Paul has expressed a desire previously, as we've read, to want to go to Rome. Rome is the centre of the empire. Rome is where the emperor is. Rome is where all the top people are. If you want to go to the most important place, you want to go to Rome. Paul had a desire to go there and to preach the gospel. And God says to him here, a word from the Lord that night, despite all this going on, all these arguments, all this arrests and, and the commander of the army and everything, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you've testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness at Rome. No matter what happens now, this is God's word, this will happen. We read on, Arrests, he, stands, he goes before about three more councils and stands and says the same thing again. Council, he goes stands before a king and queen, Agrippa and that. We'll, we'll do all this next, the next weeks we come back. Again, stands before them and does the gospel. He ends up shipwrecked and everything on his way to Rome. But God has said, you will testify in Rome. And if God says that, nothing will stop it. Amen. Come people trying to arrest him, come people trying to kill him, Come um, shipwreck, a snake bite, poisonous snake bites him. Nothing will stop the word that God has said from happening and Paul testifying in Rome. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were about 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we've bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing till we've killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander of the army that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you're going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we're ready to kill him before he even comes near. So when Paul's sister, son, when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. And so he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand went inside and asked privately, what is it you've got to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they've killed him. And now they're ready, waiting for the promise from you. 
So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, Tell no one you've revealed these things to me. Just do. 23, 24. Then he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, and provide mounts to set Paul on, and bring him safely to Felix the governor. Praise God, we needed verse 11 we've just read before this. God has promised he will go to Rome and preach the gospel. But at the same time, there's 40 of the very devout, um, over-the-top Jews who have bound themselves under an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they kill Paul. Stupid comment, but I presume they must have all died because Paul went to Rome. So if they didn't eat and drink, <laughs> eat and drink <laughs> they never had the chance to kill him. So goodness knows what happened or they broke their oath. Um, and they're even planned. They go to the council and say, tell the commander to bring Paul down tomorrow to you so you can ask him more questions. While he's on the way, we're going to ambush him and kill him. They've plotted. They've planned. They've made their schemes. Such is the strength. We've seen so many times in Acts the strength of the opposition. We, we talk about, we know as Christians about spiritual warfare, we know about Satan and all his minions or the angels that fell with him, the demons that on his side. Praise God, whatever God has said, whatever God has promised, if it's a word definitely from him, will come to pass, no matter what the opposition. But we do underestimate sometimes the strength of the opposition that there is against us. And praise God, somebody heard when Paul's sister's son, who knew apart from this one little verse here, <laughs> and it's because... He hears and goes to the commander and tells him. It doesn't even matter who he is. He could have been a nobody off the street who heard and went and told him. But Paul's sister's son, did you know Paul had a sister? Did you know Paul's sister had a son? Which makes him Paul's nephew. No. And he don't really matter in a sense. And he's never mentioned again. But praise God for that one little verse. If you ever thought in a sense Paul wasn't normal or didn't have a family or something... He was. And he hears this, and he goes and tells Paul, Paul says to one of the centurions, take him to the commander. Takes him to the commander and he tells him what he's heard. And the commander decides this is now getting too big. This is now getting too dangerous. And in fact, probably I'm a little commander with a little garrison and I'm going to struggle to be able to protect Paul if this carries on with this amount of opposition. I cannot keep him alive necessarily. So he decides there and then, the middle of the night, go and get 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. That's 470 people to take one Paul. <laughs> to the garrison at Caesarea. I'm presuming you get the impression you go on, the garrison at Caesarea was bigger, more fortified, more soldiers, more people there. And that's where the governor is. The governor, Felix the governor, or Claudius Lysias, um, which must presumably be, must be like his full name. And he writes a letter to him, we won't read this, we'll start there next time. He writes a letter to him, explaining who this man is, and I'm sending him to you for you to protect him and try and find out what's going on. Because it's now above me, it's above my pay grade. And a bit again like Jesus. Jesus went back and forth, didn't he? First to see the high priest and his understudy. And then to a uh, Pilate. And then sent to Herod. And back and forth, Jesus went further and further up, as it were, up the hierarchy of the important people in his trial. Paul here is doing just the same. 
You don't really realise, and Paul may, even maybe Paul doesn't realise, if you could meet Paul now and could tell him some of this. Paul prayed in one of his places, and we used to sing it a lot in this song. Paul wanted to be like Jesus. Paul prays at one point, I'm about ready to die. You know, I just want to know the sufferings of Jesus. I'm prepared not just to know him as my Lord and Saviour and something, but I want to be so deeply known with him, I want to go through what he went through. And probably of anybody almost, in certain, you can't say the world because we don't know, it's not written down, but in the Bible, the person who probably closely followed and went through most things Jesus did is Paul. And in a sense, Paul's prayer was answered, whether he realised. You almost went through the same the shouting against you was almost the same words as said to Jesus. You were dragged around the various courts and that of different hierarchies of people and stood before them just like Jesus did. At the end of the day, he also loses his life. I don't, that doesn't say whether he was crucified and his crucifixion won't mean the same as Jesus. He's not God, he's just a human being crucified. But... Almost his prayer of wanting to go through everything Jesus did was answered. Praise God, we'll start there, that letter, and then what carries on as he goes before more and more people um, next time I speak. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for your word, Lord. Thank you so much for everything it contains. Thank you for the major truth, Lord, that it contains about uh, being sinners and needing to be saved and about you providing a saviour, Lord. Thank you again for, Lord, the wider picture of the church being set up and what we've looked at there. Thank you again for this one-man pool, Lord. Your promises to him that you absolutely kept. Lord, thank you that he did. And we'll read when we get to the very end, chapter 28, Lord, that he gets to Rome. Lord, we thank you for your protection over him against all the opposition, which was exceedingly strong, Lord. And we thank you for his desire to really, and maybe he felt it the most. Paul's another one that says, those who have been forgiven much love much. And Paul's somebody who actually almost was as far the other way as you could go. In terms of killing Christians, murdering people, Lord. Wanted then to go as far as he could deeply with you. We thank you for the little things as well, the throwaway lines and comments. That he had a sister, Lord, and he had a nephew. And he had a family, Lord. People that were around him. Thank you for these lovely, beautiful little things as well, Lord. That almost as well make him normal, make him understandable to us. Lord, that actually all of this is for us as well. Lord, the things you say are relevant for us, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. We again just give ourselves to you. Keep, Lord, speaking to us. Keep changing us. Keep moving in our lives, Lord, we pray, to also make all of us more like Jesus. Amen.